A popular Chinese restaurant chain denies sending surveillance footage from overseas locations back to China, but some say they're not so sure. The U.S. is stepping up to help India. That's after the White House faced criticism in the past for not doing enough to aid the important ally. 500 American scientists are under investigation over concerning ties with foreign regimes. Over 90 percent of those investigated last year had been receiving undisclosed funding from Beijing. A Chinese priest urges Pope Francis to speak up for China's orphans. At the same time, Beijing is ramping up its crackdown on Catholics in the country. And Germany has approved stricter rules for its 5G networks. The move boosts politicians' power to block foreign gear that could endanger national security. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A popular Chinese restaurant chain is denying accusations that it sends surveillance footage from overseas locations back to China. It's also denying using facial recognition with footage of its customers. NTD's Don Ma has more. Chinese restaurant chain Hai Di Lao is denying accusations that it is sending surveillance footage from overseas locations back to its headquarters in China. NTD reached out to a Hai Di Lao restaurant supervisor in Vancouver, Canada. I will not send the footage back to China. News outlet Sunday Guardian Live first made the accusations. The Heidi Lao restaurant manager in Vancouver previously told NTD that their company's Chinese founder is able to see real-time security footage remotely, even across continents. The supervisor, however, refused to support the manager's statement in a phone call with NTD. Please send an email to the company. I'm just an employee. I don't have the authority to answer your question. Following the phone call, NTD emailed the headquarters of the eatery in China and asked if Heidi Lao security camera footage from overseas locations is being sent to China and whether the cameras are manufactured by a Chinese surveillance company with alleged ties to the Chinese military. The Heidi Lao headquarter did not respond before airtime. Amid these accusations, the Taiwanese branch of Heidi Lao came out with a statement separately last Thursday. They admitted that they were recording footage of their customers, but said it was for safety and customer service purposes. They also denied the footage will be sent to other locations or that they ever used facial recognition with the footage. The statement didn't seem to clear the controversy completely. Some Taiwanese netizens showed support for it, while some remained skeptical. Some netizens said that it's actually beneficial if the security footage is for safety purposes. Others said that it's up to customers to decide whether they choose to eat there or not. Netizens skeptical of the statement pointed out that the restaurant chain is a Chinese-funded enterprise, and some question whether the Taiwanese branch will be able to refuse sending the footage if the Chinese headquarter ever requested it. Another netizen pointed out that some of the restaurant's cameras are manufactured by a Chinese surveillance company with alleged ties to the Chinese military. A Taiwanese politician has also weighed in on this matter. If a company has communist capital or a Chinese-funded background, it should be scrutinized over this in order to protect Taiwan's freedom and democracy. The Heidi Lao restaurant chain was established in China's southwestern province of Sichuan in 1994. It's one of the largest restaurant chains in China, with more than 900 locations globally. They can be found in the U.S., Canada, Australia, the U.K., and Taiwan, among other countries. According to Chinese law, companies in China are required to hand over information to the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, if the party ever requested it. Don Ma, NTD News. The Biden administration is agreeing to help India alleviate the surge in CCP virus cases there. That's after President Biden faced criticism for inaction. The administration on Sunday partially lifted a ban on exporting raw materials that the Indians can use to produce vaccines. The U.S. will also send test kits, drugs and ventilators. The world's most populous democracy is now facing the worst new wave of infections. Mass cremations are held across the country every day. Two weeks ago, Indian vaccine maker the Serum Institute of India appealed to Biden for help. The firm's chief executive wrote on Twitter that I humbly request you to lift the embargo of raw material exports out of the U.S. so that vaccine production can ramp up. But the administration waited until Sunday. 
When asked last Thursday why the U.S. would not lift the ban, the State Department responded, uh, we have a special responsibility uh, to the American people. people. This country has been hit harder than any other country around the world, uh, more than 550,000 deaths. And it's, of course, not only in our interest uh, to see Americans vaccinated, it's in the interest of the rest of the world uh, to see Americans uh, vaccinated. The reaction from the U.S. has previously triggered some angry response from India. But the U.S. response has been disappointing. Joe Biden has said he understands India's needs. But in the middle of shortages and deaths, understanding does not count for much. Last April, India reversed its export ban and donated large amounts of critical drugs to the U.S. The Trump administration requested the move. Biden acknowledged the help in his Twitter post on Sunday. He had also faced pressure to donate stockpiled vaccine jabs to India. The U.S. has stockpiled about 30 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine. The type is approved in India and 70 other countries, but not in the U.S. A Mumbai politician wrote on Twitter earlier that by stockpiling vaccines and blocking the export of crucial raw materials needed for vaccine production, the United States is undermining the strategic Indo-U.S. partnership. His city is one of the hardest hit regions during the new wave of infections. Global health experts also called on the U.S. to donate the stockpiled vaccines to India. The Biden administration agreed to sending vaccines on Monday. The Chinese regime has tried to stoke up tensions between the two countries. Chinese Communist Party or CCP mouthpiece Global Times blasted the U.S. for failing to help and claimed that the closeness between the U.S. and India is fragile and superficial. Washington sees India as a key partner to counter the Chinese regime's aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. That's as the South Asian country's anti-Beijing sentiment is on the rise since last year's border dispute. India is currently part of a strategic partnership called the Quad. It includes the U.S., Japan and Australia. The alliance is seen as a potential Asian version of NATO. The U.S. National Institute of Health is flagging over 500 federally funded scientists that may have concerning ties with foreign regimes. An official tells senators the biggest concern is that scientists are hiding additional funding they receive from foreign actors. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Dr. Michael Lauer from the National Institute of Health, or NIH, tells the Senate Health Committee about foreign influences in American research. A few foreign governments have initiated systematic programs to exploit the collaborative nature of biomedical research and influence U.S. taxpayer-funded researchers. The threat is significant, exactly as you say. Um, we have identified over 500 scientists of concern. Uh, so far, we've reached out to institutions on over 200. Uh, each of these require a tremendous amount of work to figure out what exactly has been happening. He says as of April, the NIH has contacted more than 90 institutions with concerns involving over 200 of the scientists, and they are trying to reach out to more. According to NIH numbers from 2020, 93 percent of the 189 scientists they had investigated received undisclosed funding from the Chinese regime. Uh, there have been over 100 scientists who have been removed from the NIH ecosystem through a variety of ways, uh, resignations, terminations, premature retirements, or internal debarments. Most of these cases involve an Asian man in his 50s, but Lauer says the NIH also identified scientists of concern who are not foreign-born and not ethnically Chinese. Candace Wright from the Government Accountability Office tells the committee investigators need better training. We heard from, um, you know, certainly a uh, number of the, the principal investigators that many of them either were not aware of foreign talent recruitment programs or just simply didn't even know how they would go about identifying, uh, identifying such programs. And Wright says the NIH needs, needs to enhance its disclosure policy. Her office recommended that the NIH not just ask about financial conflicts of interest, but also about non-financial ones, like conflicting commitments of time and effort. A Health and Human Services Department official also weighs in. OIG has identified the threat of foreign government action aimed at unduly influencing and capitalizing on taxpayer-funded re medical research as a top management challenge for HHS. And we also suggest doing more to address this vulnerability in OIG's top 25 recommendations. 
Earlier this week, a math professor in Illinois was indicted for hiding funding he received from Beijing while applying for federal grants. And on Thursday, a Chinese-born chemist was found guilty of conspiring to steal U.S. trade secrets worth $120 million. Allison Lee, NTD News. Texas lawmakers are speaking out against forced organ harvesting practices in China. The sponsors of the new bill spoke to NTD about why the bill is so important for Texans and for all people everywhere. Lawmakers in Texas are speaking out against forced organ harvesting in China. Everything about it goes against treating an individual with the dignity that they deserve simply by being a human being. And that's an atrocity. That's a human rights violation that no nation should turn a blind eye to. State Senators Angela Paxton, Donna Campbell, and 10 other Republican and Democrat state senators sponsored a resolution in January called Condemning China's Practice of Involuntary Organ Harvesting. For the better part of two decades, the Chinese Communist regime has been forcefully harvesting organs from prisoners of conscience. That's according to an independent tribunal. The regime specifically targeted adherents of the spiritual group Falun Dafa. Paxton says the resolution matters to Texans in two ways. First, it raises awareness. Many things like this, people just don't speak up about. And so people will just think, oh, that's just a rumor. I just heard that. And we want to go on record as saying, no, this is happening and we condemn it. And second, the resolution encourages the medical community to warn Texans about the risks of traveling to China for organ transplants. Some Americans partake in organ tourism, traveling to China for transplants because organs are so readily available there. So hopefully this resolution will say to the medical community, tell your patients this is wrong. Because I think patients unknowingly become a partner with the murdering of innocent people Supporters of the resolution hope this resolution will spread the word and ultimately pressure the regime to shut it down. There needs to be a global outcry that this is wrong. Nations need to sanction China for this kind of behavior. The resolution was unanimously passed in the Senate and is making its way to the House floor before landing on the governor's desk. New York's public transit agency is canceling testing programs for one of its cameras. That's after it found out they have ties to the Chinese communist regime and facial recognition technology. And it is Don Tran has the details. Back in 2017, a Chinese company was given over $300,000 to make New York City's subway system better. But after the MTA ended the testing program for one of its cameras, it now seems the agency doesn't want anything to do with the company anymore. The new cameras were part of a years-long effort by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or MTA, to improve security and put more eyes underground. They began monitoring passengers on the G-Line train last Thursday and were set to be there for a year to see how it worked. But officials have now retired the new tech. The company that produced the cameras is Suzhou Huachi and was acquired by B Railway Transportation Technology. B Railway Transportation Technology is a Chinese company that has ties to its government. It listed facial recognition technology among its specialties in a 2019 report. While sources say the company does have a connection to facial recognition technology, the MTA's chairman says that facial recognition was not used in any of the subway system security cameras. Don Tran, NTD News, New York. Now we turn to Beijing's latest crackdown on Chinese Catholics. A Chinese priest is urging Pope Francis to speak up for China's orphans. This comes as the Chinese regime shuts down Catholic orphanages in a northern Chinese province. Among those shut down is an orphanage called Li Ming Home. A staff member there says authorities order them to transfer all the orphans under 18 to state-run facilities. To protect her identity, we gave her a pseudonym, Zhao Li. We have developed affections for these children while raising them, so to say goodbye all of a sudden is like cutting them off from us emotionally. The orphanage was set up in the 1980s to take in abandoned children. Zhao says some of the orphans are disabled and often pass away before they are in their 30s. It's like accompanying them through their life journey. Some children are pretty weak, and they are already pretty happy to be alive just for one more day. 
Writing to a Catholic press agency under the pen name of Wen Dao, a Chinese priest says he is concerned there's more to the shutdown than it seems. He believes it is part of Chinese authorities' broader plan to reduce the influence of Catholic churches in China. China has about 12 million Catholics, and their churches are divided into two groups, the state-run ones and the underground ones. The state-run associations reject the Pope's authority, but the underground ones recognize it. Beijing has escalated crackdowns in both types in recent years. In some places, officials have removed crosses from churches and prevented believers from gathering. Aside from addressing the shutdown of orphanages, the priest also accuses Chinese officials of using the pandemic to tighten their grip on churches. He says Catholics across China report one common phenomenon. That is, authorities allow shopping malls and tourist attractions to open, but put churches under lockdown. And it's not just churches. The priest heard from some Chinese Catholics that some schools are checking students' and teachers' beliefs, and that some Catholic students were forced to drop out of school, while some teachers' careers were in jeopardy for being Catholic. The priest writes the goal is to turn schools into religion-free areas, making students and teachers realize that it is better to have no religion at all. The priest also expresses disappointment in a historic deal between the Vatican and Beijing. Many see the 2018 deal as an ice-breaking move. That's because Beijing has not had any official ties with the Vatican in almost seven decades. The deal allows both Beijing and the Pope to appoint bishops in China. Following the deal, the Pope recognized eight Chinese bishops Beijing appointed without his approval. The Chinese priest says many churchgoers in China cheer the deal because they thought the situation would improve. But what happened later proved the opposite. After that, authorities tore down many churches. They ordered every church to hang flags to promote the Communist Party's ideology. And those under 18 can't take part in church activities. The priest says when this happened, the Chinese churches hoped to get support from the Vatican. But the Holy See has remained silent. He says like the orphans, Catholics in China are a minority. And they only have the weakest of voices in the face of injustice. And he'd like to ask the Pope one question. Can you hear the weakest and truest voices of the church in China? A Chinese billionaire is in custody for speaking out against the communist regime. He's facing the possibility of heavy sentencing after Beijing laid more charges against him. NTD's Becky Zhou has the details. China's top prosecutor's office has given police the go-ahead to arrest a billionaire. The police issued an official arrest notice last Thursday. The man in question has been known to publicly criticize the communist regime for years. Billionaire Sun Dawu owns a major agriculture company. He's facing two new criminal charges in China's Hebei province, namely illegal mining and forced trading. A human rights advocacy website says the term mining refers to the hot spring that Sun's hotel has been using for over a decade. But some are questioning the charge, saying local officials should have taken action against Sun years ago if he's been breaking the law. The charge comes five months after police detained Sun as well as his wife, two sons and other executives from his company. Sun now faces eight charges total. It's the second time he's been arrested and charged. The first was in 2003. Police are also accusing Sun of what they call interrupting production and operation and disrupting public affairs. But social media users aren't buying the allegations. One of them wrote online, the regime can come up with all kinds of excuses if it wants to accuse someone of committing a crime. Police arrested Sun last November. Weeks before he was taken into custody, Sun posted a bold comment on Weibo, a microblogging website similar to Twitter. He wrote, what does mafia-run society mean? You can't see the truth amid the hustle and bustle even on sunny days. Neither can you hear different voices. The rich and powerful do whatever they want, whereas people of integrity can't move an inch. Around the same time, Sun also gave an interview to a foreign media outlet and criticized China's economic system in his comments. Chinese media once honored the 66-year-old with the title of distinction, an entrepreneur with excellent character. He received the award for insisting on running an independent business and refusing to collude with corrupted officials. He says he aimed to benefit his employees and society.
But some of Sun's later comments started causing him trouble, specifically those that contradict the communist regime's narrative. In 2015, Sun wrote an article openly supporting human rights lawyers. He wrote, What can we common people do when faced with terror? Open our eyes wide with fear and scream. Not only is it an animal instinct, but also indicates modern people still have a conscience. That's the minimum requirement for mankind to survive. Sun will remain in custody until May 16th at minimum. Reporting by Becky Zhou, NTD News. A top Beijing official is strengthening China's pushback against the West. He says China will never abide by the constitutionalism embraced by the West, nor will the regime accept America's three-party system or judicial independence. That's according to a recent article published by the Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpiece. It was written by Wang Chen, the vice chairman of the National People's Congress of China. He claims current world powers reflect the rise of the East and the decline of the West. His article reiterates Communist Party leader Xi Jinping's speech from 2019. During his remarks, Xi had said China must not go on the path of judicial independence. He also claimed China must use Chinese law as a weapon against foreign troublemakers. Wang's article also says China's version of the rule of law must fit its own conditions and that the Communist Party should work to inject Chinese elements when international laws are set. Chinese legal professional Zhang Guangzhong told Radio Free Asia that Xi Jinping is competing for a say in the international community. Earlier last week, Xi Jinping commented on what he called the shared future of humanity during Asia's regional Boao Forum. He also seemed to dish out a veiled insult toward the U.S., saying big countries should behave like big countries. But two days later, during U.S. President Biden's climate summit, Xi Jinping didn't propose any emission reduction targets. Instead, he put forward the so-called principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. He also requested financial and technological support from developed countries. Chinese human rights lawyer Chen Jianggang told Radio Free Asia that political reform is impossible under the Communist Party's rule. He explained communist officials will never allow it, as it would reduce the party's power and return it to the people. He added that reform would also reveal the true history of the regime's rule, which would aid its collapse. Chloe Zhao has made history at the 2021 Academy Awards. She is the first Asian woman to win Best Director for her film Nomadland and just the second woman to Thank ever you. win Thank the award. The Zhao took home the Thank Oscar for Best Director. Brilliant her brilliant film Nomadland Thank tells the story you. of a woman in her 60s My and other transient workers in the American West. The what film also won Best Picture, while the Best Actress Award went to Frances McDormand for her lead role. 39-year-old Zhao was born in Beijing and went to college and film school in the United States. Her success has not yet been recognized by the country of her birth. China's ruling Communist Party has instead been downplaying Zhao's success. That's because of comments she made in the past that criticized the regime. A post by a film magazine announcing Zhao Zhuin was censored on Chinese social media. Germany seems to have made a decision about China-based telecom companies. Authorities there are taking a hard line against them, following the lead of foreign allies. German politicians approved stricter rules for 5G in the country on Friday. It brings the country's policy closer in line with the UK and France on regulating sensitive network technology. The new law follows earlier disapproval from politicians to a German Chancellor Angela Merkel's initial approach. Merkel had previously supported signing an investment deal with Beijing, but the U.S. advised her against it. Media outlet Politico reports that the move removes power from some government departments that have supported Huawei in the past. Likewise, it boosts the power of departments that aim to block Huawei 5G contracts. Under the law, telecom operators must get the green light from authorities before buying 5G parts from suppliers like Huawei. Purchase proposals will be evaluated based on the potential for national security threats. This process will take two to four months to complete. The law also grants authorities the power to block any incoming equipment or contracts with Huawei. In addition, suppliers must prove themselves by submitting a declaration of trustworthiness and meeting certain criteria. On top of that, all new 5G parts will be measured against security policy goals from Germany, the EU and NATO.
Huawei says it welcomes the new law. The head of the company's German branch says that all equipment suppliers will be made to meet security standards. The new law comes ahead of Germany's federal election, scheduled for September. After Merkel steps down, the country's new government will decide how to apply the new security rules. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you.